You know, we, we can't get into injuries. You know, we, we played a good hockey team that beat us. You know, that's the bottom line. Hey now, boys and girls, welcome into the Pucknologist here on TealtownUSA.com. I'm your host, AJ Strong, and I'm rolling solo, kids. So do us a favor, remember to subscribe to this cast, whether you're on SoundCloud or Spotify or iTunes or whatever podcast platform floats your boat. Do us a favor, hit the subscribe button, and make sure to do the same on the YouTube channel, and check out Teal Town After Dark. The only live and interactive post-game show for you Sharks. Going live on YouTube after every single Sharks game. And of course, follow us on the social, Twitter and Instagram, both of them at Teal Town USA. And do not forget, we got a couple Win It For Jumbo shirts still left. You can grab those at tealtownusa.com. And once again, thank you for supporting us with that purchase. That is awesome. So, the series is over the sharks are out and as they say as they say in hockey let's do that hockey so let's do that hockey it came down to six games oh it was it hurt it hurt that last one kind of hurt especially when you consider that three key guys not able to go so let's start with game one. The Sharks would pick up a victory, 6-3. to three. Couture would open the scoring in this one on his way to a three-point night, including an empty netter. Timo Meyer also would have a three-point night, first off a great steal and then a ridiculously cool bank shot. Pavelski would also get on the board after taking three swings at a puck before finally connecting during a five-on-three, while LeBanc would put one through on a screen. Now, Jones did let in three, good for a 9.05 save percentage, stopping 28 of 31. But really, the only bad goal Jones had was overcommitting on O'Reilly's tally. I think we'll forgive him for that one. Hard hitting game with 76 hits between the two clubs. Obviously, both teams trying to send a little physical message to begin this. And the Sharks dominated the circle 58 to 42, but that tally was much higher in favor of the Sharks in the first period. But. The Sharks were only able to muster five shots on goal in the third period, but typically when you're playing with the lead, you're not really caring about, you know, bumping the total on the shot clock. But the Pavelski goal where he got three swings on the five-on-three, that was a good one. 20 seconds on the five-on-three. They send it down low to Pavelski, now to Burns, now to Eric Carlson, now to Burns. Down low, Pavelski the shot, save, score! Joe Pavelski got his own rebound, and he does a fist pump as he turns to the left wing corner. The Sharks score five on three, and they lead two nothing. And I love it when he's oh, he got his own rebound. Uh, he he got his own rebound like three times on that goal, but I'll take it anyway. It was awesome. And then we have Meyer's first goal of the night. Meyer steals it from Pareko, moves around Bowmeister. He's by himself. He's in front. He scores. Timo Meyer steals the puck, moved around the other defenseman, was by himself, and looked like he was going to drag the puck from the backhand side of the stick to the forehand. But at the last second, he kept it on the backhand and tipped it short side. That's a spectacular goal by Timo Meyer to make it 4-2 Sharks. It really was a spectacular goal. You go back and look at that. Uh, <laughs> pylons, the St. Louis defense, and just, oh, my Lord. Make... Made Bennington the maybe the one or two times that Bennington looked a little out of place. We all know Jordan Bennington had himself a hell of a series, but that was one goal that you got to look at and say, okay, you got me on that one. But the one that I think was a little more flukier was Meyer's second. Sharks move back in, drop pass. Here's Vlasic, the shot toward the net. Save rebound, score! Timo Meyer behind the net, got the rebound of that shot, and banked it from behind the goal line, off done, and in. And the Sharks lead 5-2. to two. Yeah, this was a really odd goal. You're not even sure how that went in until you saw the replay from about 20 different angles. But again, the Sharks would win this 1-6-3 with some very cool goals happening from the Sharks. 
And we move on to game two, of course. Sharks lose this one 4-2 to two. for some reason. The Sharks in this playoffs for 2019 could not win game two. Also had a difficult time winning game four. Pretty much any even-numbered game they were having issues with, with the exception, of course, of the first round. But the Sharks lose this one 4-2. to two. And this is another one where, uh, you know, they lose it after winning game one for the third straight series and give up a goal at 234 into the game to Jaden Schwartz, who had himself a monster series. Cannot be denied. Couture would net the only two goals for San Jose to tie this game, at least. One of them coming shorthanded. And it was a beaut. O'Reilly wins the draw for the St. Louis power play. Big PK, and it's stolen by Couture. He races away with it. He's going to have a shorthanded chance. He's in. He shoots. He scores! Logan Couture, Mr. Clutch, scores shorthanded. The Sharks are on the board, and the Blues are stunned. Well, they weren't stunned for much longer after that, but either way, that was another spectacular goal from Logan Couture, who clearly just dominated all the postseason and was the leader for the Sharks. Although, interesting quote from Logan following this game, basically saying it's discouraging, it's frustrating, because we're going to need everyone here if we're going to beat these guys. Now, you can take into that what you will. You don't know if he's in a vague roundabout way calling guys out just throwing that out there you don't know and up to this point you know the penalty kill had been great but the power play was not so great and in this one Jones an 840 save percentage now I'm not hanging everything on Jones so don't at me I'm just saying that the save percentage not as good this series as it was the previous series but it is what it is And Couture did have himself, uh, I mean, the only guy who could score in this one. And here's Jumbo on Couture afterwards. He's just competitive. You know, he's ultra competitive. And he just, you know, he's a goal scorer by nature. And he just, uh, he doesn't need much to score a goal. But just, you know, very, very, very competitive guy. And Coach DeBoer on his post game. I think the story of the game was we didn't have enough participants across the board. I thought Logan Couture was pretty good. A couple other guys, but... You know it's tough to win this time of year if you if you don't have everybody going. And I thought they got they got contributions from everybody uh, like we did in the first night. So we've been here before and we know how to handle this. Now I don't know about you guys. It sounded a little bit like Coach DeBoer was echoing Couture's comments. So you know too many participants or not enough guys driving the bus. Who knows? Too many passengers. But. The Sharks would tie, or the the series would be tied after two, going on to game three, and we all know about game three. Here we go, guys. This is going to take a while. The Sharks win this one, five to four in overtime. We see Haley slot in for Sorensen in this one, and the Sharks would have a great first period as EK65 gets his first goal, not of the playoffs, of 2019. (laughs) And Jumbo would get his third goal of the playoffs, In the second period, things start to change a little bit. Second period, the Sharks allow Steen a goal, 118 into the period, yet Jumbo would answer 19 seconds later. Then it all kind of came undone for a hot minute when St. Louis would score three unanswered, including two by Perron. And with a couple minutes left, Jones would be pulled, and Couture would get his 14th with a minute one left on the clock and would send it to overtime. And then we know what happened in overtime. EK65 from Nyquist and Meyer would end it at 523, and NHL Twitter lost its mind after Meyer looks to have hand-passed it, but it does not get called. Was it a hand-pass? Depends on who you talk to. I look at it and I say, yeah, that that should have been a whistle, but this is what happens. Lots of stuff does not get called, which we will get into in a little bit, but yeah, you could make an argument that Meyer was just slapping the puck down to the ice. It didn't, it clearly didn't look like he was trying to slap it to another player, uh, but either way, it doesn't matter. That's typically a hand pass that should have been called. Uh, the funny thing is though, uh, NHL Twitter didn't have much to say 
about a missed delay of game call in this, uh, a missed slash on Haley, or Bly's headshot on Justin Braun, which would be the second headshot Braun has taken in these playoffs that is not called a penalty, nor does Department of Player Safety get involved whatsoever. And funnily enough, a little while later, Blyce actually admitted that he got Braun in the head. Again, nothing coming from Department of Player Safety. And getting back to Jones, he's still unable to crack the 900 ceiling and posts an 875 save percentage. But uh, let's hear the highlights first, shall we? Here's Couture tying things up. From the faceoff, Blues have it. Now the Sharks, Joe Thornton puts back to the point. Kept in, skate of Carlson. Eric goes to Brent Burns near boards. Down low to Thornton. Center repeat, Kowalski. Tips it and go. They score! Logan Couture with 59.6 seconds to play has just tied the game 4-4. So Ruzi says 59 point whatever seconds. I think the official tally had it at 1.01, but hey, we're not going to split hairs in here, but... Here's Ruzanowski and Hedekin explaining everything about the EK65 overtime goal. Sharks get the rebound and move it out. Meyer, long pass. Couture gets it. Tipped by Nyquist across the line. Couldn't get the pass back. And the Sharks do get the puck recovered. Nyquist to the right side. Meyer going to the net. Eric Carlson. Meyer the shot. Poked that. Why? Meyer sends in front. Nyquist. Eric Carlson shot. Score! Eric Carlson gets the shot away. It might have been tipped in front, and it is a Sharks 5-4 win. But the Blues are protesting. They say that might have been gloved in the net. So hold on, folks. This one might not be over. No, they did not call a hand pass here, folks. They did not call a hand pass. Nobody called it. It wasn't blown dead. They can't call this back. This cannot be challenged. This game is over. And over it was, but not without the controversy. Even NHL Executive Vice President Colin Campbell says, it's so unfair the game ended that way, the wrong way. Not really sure why an executive VP would come out and have something to say about this, but it'd be nice if maybe he also came out and said maybe Department of Player Safety needs to be uh, overhauled. Uh, Evidently, though, the NHL does... Some would admit that the refs missed the call and referees Mark Jonette and Mark Jonette and Dan O'Rourke are gone for the remainder of the playoffs, joining Dan O'Halloran and Eric Furlot, who were relieved after Game 7 versus Vegas. Now, this is the part that obviously is tough to stomach, and it creates a narrative that I hate. Anything that good now that happens to the Sharks and it's everybody going, the NHL is rigged. It's just rigged. It's so rigged for the Sharks to win. Now, obviously, the next few games would prove that to be a ridiculous statement, but it also created a mm, sort of a reverse narrative that, and anything bad that happens, that's what the Sharks deserve. Okay, fine. If that's how you want to play it, sure. But let's hear about the kind of officiating that we've seen from Captain Joe Pavelski after game three. Yeah, you know what? There's a few calls. You're going to get them. You're not going to get certain ones. Um, Everyone keeps talking about the hand pass, so there must have been something there. But at the end of the day, it was there were calls that go both ways. That's the playoffs. There's adversity. You always got to adjust and handle it and keep your cool. And at times we've done a great job with it, and at times we could be better. You know, it's always just a a lesson that at the end of the night it's all about the wins and losses if you get the extra call great if not you really have to um you know just keep playing because you know they're they're not trying to screw anybody they really aren't they're they're good guys yeah the refs are doing the best they can it's an incredibly fast game and if you're on that fence of the the the, the nhl that they just they're rigging it in the sharks favor Uh, You clearly haven't been paying attention to hockey for the last, I don't even know how many years. Uh, If you're sitting there trying to say that the refs are doing anything in in regards to trying to make sure that one team wins over another, you're clearly not watching an entire series. So for everybody out there who sits and tries to pontificate about, this is... The Sharks are catching all the breaks and this and that. Well, I can show you plenty of times where the Sharks didn't catch a break. Why don't you, why don't you look up 2011 stanchion goal? That's, uh, that's a time the Sharks did not catch a break. 
It was more than a few times the Sharks haven't caught a break. I'm not saying that now the Sharks deserve the breaks because you make your own breaks. You do what you can. You try to win the game. As Pavelski said, sometimes the calls go your way, sometimes they don't, and you just play to the best you can to sit there and endlessly rant and rave and bitch about, oh, it's the officiating, the the officials are against us is just a silly, lazy, and ignorant narrative, to be quite honest. Uh, But the whole lucky, that narrative kind of sticks with me a little bit, because after years of watching hockey, I was like, there's been so many, it's not as if the Sharks are the first team to ever be thought of as lucky. But not only did it irk me, it also irked Peter DeBoer. You play 60 minutes of hockey. You know, this team, it, it irks me uh, when you use words like that because this is a team that's, we've played four or five elimination games. Not, not, not moments, uh, games. You know, 12 to 15 periods of elimination hockey against Vegas, uh, against Colorado in Game 7. So... It's a ridiculous statement. There's been some moments in games that have been decided, and, and I, I heard Rod Brindamore speak about it this morning. I read an article, and I thought he said it best. Those things happen so quickly on the ice, and there's so many bodies flying around, and, and there's split-second decisions, and it's easy when we sit there on a bench or you guys sit there and look at a TV monitor and and criticize and, and hold people uh, accountable for, for errors that happen in milliseconds. So... You know what? We've we found a way, and we we've faced a lot of adversity. Uh, we've had calls go against us, uh, and we've had calls go for us, and we're still standing. And uh, you know, for anybody to to minimize that, I think uh, is disrespectful to our group and what we've done. Yeah, I uh, couldn't have put it better myself. That you know, some days you're the windshield, some days you're the bug, uh, and it you know it's a great thing if more often than not you're the windshield. But that's the way that one would shake out. We move on to game four. And in this one, oh boy, the Sharks would lose two to one. Thus ending the whole two or fewer streak that had gone 39-0 and up until this point. Marcus Sorensen would slide back in for Haley. And Milk with the jumbo line, though. Sorensen gets pushed down to the fourth. Vince Dunn would be out after taking a puck to the face in his last game uh and boy if you saw that uh you know stick taps to Dunn hope he's okay haven't really heard much since but he did not look good coming off the ice Uh, essentially collapsing on the bench you gotta feel for that as much as you want your team to win you never want to see anybody whether it's the official someone on your team someone on the opposing team whatever you don't want to see somebody in that much distress that was that was bad But back to the game. The Sharks again would give up a goal in the first five minutes, this time coming at 35 seconds to Barbashev. And Bozak would score at 17.53 on the power play later in that period. The Sharks would outshoot the Blues 30-22, but just were only able to get one by Bennington in this one. But at least this one was on the power play. A teaser goal coming at 6.48 of the third. There's Hurdle dancing his way across the line. O'Reilly fell down. Dished it off. Hurdle, I should say, Couture on the right side boards. Gave it to Eric Carlson. Now back to Burns with a shot save. Score! Right in front of the net. Joe Pavelski jamming at the puck. And Tomas Hurdle was right there too. The Sharks get on the board with an absolutely critical power play goal. And Hurdle and Pavelski were there to poke it home. And despite only putting up one goal in this game, uh, Coach DeBoer, he, he said it was the best that he thought the Sharks had played this series. Yeah, I mean, really, you know, maybe the best I've felt about our game in the series so far, even though we lost. You know, we put two goals in our own net and uh, are off our own guys and uh, didn't get the start we wanted, got in our heels on the first shift and took a couple penalties. But, you know, other than that, uh, and then not finding a way to, to get a couple more goals, I, th- I thought we did a lot of good stuff. Yeah, I don't know about that line, DeBoer. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you can sit there and, and talk about how great your team looks, but when you've got this much firepower and you're only able to muster one goal, I don't know. I mean, hey, you're the head coach and I'm not, but 
tough to make a claim like that when you're only able to muster one goal and then you're only able to muster yet another goal over the next two games. Tough, tough way to go, but let's get on to game five. Oh, the dreaded game five where the Sharks were shut out five to nothing. Michael Haley's back in the lineup for Sorensen and the Blues would score three straight unassisted goals and Jaden Shorts would get a hat trick and injuries would absolutely decimate the Sharks as Hurdle, EK65, Donskoy, and Pavelski would all leave with some sort of injury. Uh, Donskoy taking a, a shot to the grill. And we see headshots on both Hurdle coming from Barbashev and P- Pavelski coming from Petrangelo, uh, neither of which even rated a call from Department of Player Safety. Uh <laughs> Not really sure what's going on there. It also looked like Kane might have gotten away with trying to get a knee shot on one of the Blues. And Tarasenko would score a penalty shot, and both Haley and Kane would pick up misconducts, clearly letting their emotions get the best of them. The Sharks would give up 40 shots on goal, Jones averaging an 880 save percentage five games in after posting 917 versus the Avalanche. And the refs let the Blues get away with a ton in this one. But those were all lucky, right? And the Blues just capitalized. You know, that's that's the narrative if you listen to some people. Uh, during one sequence in front of Bennington, though, Hurdle would get his stick held by Petrangelo, and both Pavelski and Jumbo would get cross-checked. Not a single infraction to be called. Uh, Peter DeBoer would also admit afterwards that he should have probably went with 7-D. It was just an overall bad game. Now, again... I don't know how many times I need to stress this until people hear the words that are coming out of my mouth. The Sharks, myself, I can't speak for anybody else other than myself. I'm not blaming the officials for the Sharks losing this game. I'm not blaming the officials for the Sharks for any of their wins. And I'm not blaming the officials for the Sharks losing this series. I'm simply pointing out what there is overwhelming and conclusive video proof of calls were gotten away with. Now, there's also some times where Burns got away with, uh, I can't remember if it was Petrangelo, no, it wasn't Petrangelo, maybe it was O'Reilly, got away with uh, giving him a little something extra. But (laughs) you want a clean game, and the only way to do that is you make calls. If, if you're calling everything, players are not going, they're, they're going to be a little bit more reluctant to take that little extra something. Especially when you look at Petrangelo getting away with throwing an elbow at Pavelski's head after a hit, which I thought, in, which I thought was a solid and clean hit. Didn't have a problem with it until Petrangelo throws his elbow up towards Pavelski's face, which of course everybody in the NHL knows. The, the the guys lost teeth in the first round. He was leaking blood out of his dome. I'm not saying you have to treat Pavelski like, uh, you know, the guy's playing hockey in a bubble. But I don't know that you need to take extra curriculars, shall we say, with a player who's known to play the game right, is a clean player, never had any issues, uh, to, to do something like that. I don't know. It's a little suspect, but hey, we move on. Let's. And speaking about these hits on Hurdle and on Braun, neither of which get anything. Here's Logan Couture's thoughts. I saw the Hurdle hit. I just watched the replay. Um, yeah, that's a tough one. Uh, but I mean, when they uh, they had one earlier in Game Three, I believe on Braun. I think it was Game Three, and nothing happened. So they can do it again, right? Again, there's there's Logan kind of calling out Department of Player Safety, saying, you know, if you're not going to do anything about this, it's going to continue. Plain and simple. Again, this is the second time Braun has taken a headshot in this playoffs and got nothing for it. Meanwhile, Joe Thornton gets suspended, and rightly so. That hit on Nosek, there was no place in hockey for that. But he did face supplemental discipline for some reason though not really sure why there's other stuff that is being gotten away with and nothing's happening 
Not really sure why. Here's Brendan Dillon on the refs. I don't want to comment on the officiating. I think both teams should be playing physical. I think sometimes when we gotta let those guys take care of that stuff when it does happen. How hard? Yeah, you don't want to. You don't want to make excuses, but you know some pretty key guys that are they're going down. Some offensive guys that when you're playing from behind like that, it's, it's tough to, to push the pace. You know, we we had a couple chances on the power play to kind of get some traction and some some looks, but um, you know I think at the end of the day we, we need to kind of ramp up our level instead of you know go the other way. And Dylan makes some fine points. You know you got to persevere. You got to play through this stuff. Uh, Coach DeBoer would also address this in his post game comments. No, I liked our first period. You know, I think I think you know a few things could have changed the game. I mean, uh, I thought we played well enough to come out of that first maybe up. I thought, you know, ar- arguably a, a five minute major on Tommy Hurdle that if it's called, you know, that's a momentum changing play right there. Um, you know, but we come out of the first down one nothing, and then Hurdle can't go, uh, and uh, you know Carlson can't go. And so we started taking on some water. I thought, you know, they took over in the second period. And then, you know, when Pav got hit high, we we lost our composure there in the third and not our finest moment. But, you know, I understand where that emotion's coming from and with what he's been through. And we've just got to regroup. We've got to go in and win a game. Now, the only thing that gets me in that is wondering why there wasn't a five-minute major given out for the hit on Hurdle. That, to me, seems a little excessive. I Should it have been two? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Five-minute major? No. That's ridiculous. And there's a certain you know amount of people out there that are making a case that, hey, maybe it's just a fact that, well, look, we've already seen two sets of officials be shown the door early in these playoffs for not getting calls right or not making a call at all, maybe the officials are a little gun-shy. Maybe they're kind of thinking, hmm, maybe it's just better to not call anything at all rather than to make a call that might be the wrong thing. Who knows? I'm sure that's more more people than not will debate that and have a good time. That's something you can talk about all summer. It's what's going to happen. It's how you it's, it's how we kill time until October, people, right? Here's Couture postgame. Um, control our emotions in the third. It's a th- three-goal game. I thought we uh, obviously took way too many penalties, and uh, you can't win or come back when you're in the box the whole the whole period. So, um, got away from us at the end. Uh, would have really liked us to control our emotions and at least give ourselves a chance. And more from Coach DeBoer. Maybe offering some regret about playing Eric Carlson in this game. Well, I mean, hindsight's twenty twenty. You know, I, I think, you know, we make those decisions based on the reports we get from the player and the medical. And you know, the the report was that felt he could he could play and get through the game. So, you know, it's easy to sit here and say, no, yeah, yeah, sure, you have regrets. Yeah, but how do you address it? You've got Ek sixty five, who evidently is saying, "Yeah, I'm coach. I'm good to go." You're working with the medical staff that clearly also has to listen to the player. If if Eric Carlson says, yeah, I'm good, and the medical training staff says, we can't find anything wrong, he says he's good, of course, if you do that, Pete, you know, Coach DeBoer is, oh, if we're good, of course you play. One of the best defensemen in the league. Yes, you're going to play. This is on EK65, people. If you know that you can only play at 40%, but you're going to lie to the medical staff or lie to your coaches and say, oh, yeah, no, I'm like 75%. I mean, I'm not saying that's what happened. It's kind of inferred that maybe EK thought he was better than he was. And to me, that's that's a detriment to the team. That's not something I think you do. But to get back to uh, these hits and whatnot, if you go back and look, speaking of EK65, he got a two-game suspension for a far, far less egregious hit on Austin Wagner back in December. Two-game suspension. You go back, you look at the video, EK65, he touches shoulder first, and going through that hit, hits the head. If that's a two-game suspension... I don't have a problem with that. What I have a problem with is that Barbashev almost 
the exact same hit, almost. Barbashev got more, he, he hit the head first before he got Hurdle's body. But not even a call. Not a call, not a fine, nothing. If you're going to take headshots out of the game, this is not the way to do it. And, you know, noted goon, fighter, whatever, uh, George Larocq coming out saying, isn't it ironic to hear the San Jose Sharks coach Peter DeBoer criticizing the officials for not giving a five-minute major to Barbashev on his hit on Hurdle? Isn't the ref? Isn't the ref? Well, okay, I have to. Uh, Larocque has a hard time uh, speaking, evidently. So, uh, said, uh, "Aren't these the referees that helped your team beat Vegas and also St. Louis in Game Three? Um, I don't remember. And again, I don't know how many times this needs to be said until people understand it. Uh, the officials were not wearing Vegas jerseys on the penalty kill." And they, the, the officials did not let in four goals in four minutes. The officials did not stop Vegas from scoring in 18 minutes of overtime in game seven. The officials did, however, give Vegas the only power play in double overtime in game six. The officials did not give up a shorthanded goal to Tomas Hurdle in game six. And you want to sit there and say the officials, uh, you know, got helped you win against St. Louis in Game Three? Sure, you could, that that argument. Yeah, you can make that argument. Absolutely, that would be correct. But to the fact that there's so many people still bringing up Vegas, and we'll we'll get to some other things about that later. But uh, this it's <laughs> it's like some of these people aren't paying attention. Uh, However, even Devin Setaguchi, Curtis Brown, and Brett Etikin all calling out Depar- Department of Player Safety. And that's just people in the Sharks organization. There are other people around the league saying, what is going on with these headshots? You know, both hits caught the head. Hurdle's head was touched before anything else. And I'm not saying Barb should be suspended. Uh, like I said, just a hearing, maybe a fine. But the fact that he, that, that there was zero, it's insane. And... We're going to see this kind of play continue. I swear it, people. You think, let, let's just see what happens in the Boston-St. Louis game. Let's see. Let's just see. But before we can get to Boston and St. Louis, of course, we have to get on to the final game of this series. Game six, the Sharks lose 5-1. to one, And, of course, the Sharks do not have Eric Carlson, Joe Pavelski, or Tomas Hurdle. Three kind of key pieces that, when healthy, are pretty good at playing some offense. And in this one, the Sharks would yet again give up a goal in the first five minutes of the first period. This one coming at 132. And the Sharks never really found any more any momentum in this game. A uh, lot of non-calls yet again. Uh, LeBanc tripped an open ice. Uh, like I said, Brent Burns got away with some stuff. I think Evander Kane got away with a little little something-something. And, uh, I mean, gee, at least Kane was doing something, right? Because he certainly wasn't putting the puck in the back of the net. Uh, And credit to the Blues, though, for killing a wounded animal. You know, could you imagine uh, the the vitriol that would come from uh, those around the league at the Blues saying, wait a minute, you couldn't beat the Sharks and they were missing their captain, their top center, and one of their top defensemen? They're, you know, one of their biggest, three of their biggest offensive weapons. I mean, Pavelski, you know, 38 goals on this season. Hurdle had his best season. Now, EK65, yeah, he had some injury issues and whatnot, but we all know that he put up a ton of assists. Uh, the guy can get things done. So when you remove three weapons, could you imagine if the Blues were not able to beat this? So you have to credit them for killing a wounded animal. They, you know, they did what you're supposed to do in that situation. Um, but you go and listen, yeah, the, the team, especially Brent Burns thought that, you know, that maybe that magic from 2016 was kind of creeping back in. Well, we went, uh, to the finals last time there, there was magic that, that we had and you could just feel it, you know, and, you know, we, we really thought we had that magic kind of going. We made it hard on ourselves and we always seemed to, to battle through it and, and get through it and get to that next step. 
Of course, the thing that Burns doesn't touch on is the fact that it might be easier to have some magic when you're not missing three of your biggest names. You can also go back to that series versus the Penguins. Hurdle wasn't able to go in that one either. But Couture can talk about missing guys. You know, we battle hard. I mean, you're missing three guys that play a lot of minutes for us. And three, three very, very good players on, in the NHL. And, um, you know, we're, we're in a tough spot. Uh, but I thought we played extremely hard. No one gave up. And uh, guys that came into the lineup that haven't played in, you know, a month or six weeks played extremely hard. And Dylan scored a big goal, so we were, we were happy for him. And would have liked to, uh, to get that one that I had to, to tie it up. And congrats to Dylan Gambrell from getting his first NHL goal. Pretty significant one, pretty big one. But it wasn't enough. And you know Joe Thornton, he's certainly not going to blame injuries for anything. You know, he's, he's one guy. You know, it's, uh, he's a big part of this team. But, you know, we, you know we, we can't get into injuries. You know, we, we played a good hockey team that beat us. You know, that's the bottom line. It certainly is. Let's hear from Coach DeBoer. I, I was proud of our group tonight. Um... You know, I don't think the score reflected the, the work that we put in. Um, you know, and I know this, what the scoreboard said at the end of the night, but I, I felt that, uh, you know, we made them earn, earn it tonight. I thought uh, we showed up and under tough circumstances, and I thought we got uh, efforts from, from everybody. So that's all you can ask. It is all you can ask, but... Boy, it would have been really fun to see two healthy squads go at it. But again, you don't control this, and that's what happens. Every team battles injuries. Every team has to deal with it at some point or another, and some teams are able to battle through. Sometimes they're not. So that wraps up six games of the Western Conference Final. You know what time it is. Time for the good, the bad, and the ugly. And, of course, the good was the penalty kill. Penalty kill was very good throughout these playoffs. Now, it got better as it went along, of course, which is very, very nice. Uh, 73% versus Vegas, but 91% versus Colorado. That's huge. The power play as now that we go into the bad. That was really bad. 24% versus Vegas, only 6% versus Colorado. Only managed one. Oh, oh, that, that's bad. That's very bad. Speaking of bad, and I spoke about it earlier, the whole lucky and deserves to win. Nobody deserves to win. These narratives are silly. You make your own luck, but nobody deserves anything. You go out there and you do what you can to help your team win. I've never seen at any point, and, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong, it's not as if, like, say, oh, in 1999, when Brett Hull's foot is in the crease and Dallas scores, wins the series, I don't ever remember anybody coming out saying, oh, you know what, Brett, that was, an, that was a nice goal, like what you did there. Uh, but, uh, you know, Buffalo really deserves to win this. You know what I mean? It's just these lazy narratives. Some of these, some of these journalists need to come up with, with new talking points or come up with something different because the, the deserve anybody who says that a team deserves to win. I don't know how much more of their stuff you need to read because it's just lazy. Uh, same thing with the lucky argument. If you, you see guys, uh, Greg Wazinski, uh, there's a guy who backpedaled <laughs> quite quickly after the series was over, talking about, oh, it would have been great to see you know, the Sharks, a healthy squad, be able to play this game. And uh, Yes, of course. Yeah, that goes without saying. But you weren't saying that earlier. You were saying stuff about the Sharks being lucky, having things handed to them. Why don't, why don't you ask these players how much this stuff is handed to them? And, of course, the ugly was the officiating. I mean, every round has included something ridiculous. Uh, whether it's the... the y you can sit here and debate left and right whether Joe Pavelski should have gotten... Uh, that that should have drawn a five-minute major in Game 7. You can talk about that all day, which most of us have. But 
you had that. Then game seven, you have the Landis Gog. Was he offside? Was he not offside? And you have all these, uh, just an incredible amount of headshots that nothing is being done. Uh, I mean, <laughs> people like Christy Yamaguchi coming out <laughs> and, and saying something about it. And yet we've got George Peros running, running shop, Department of Player Safety. You know, I, I miss the days of Shanahan when at least he would come out, they'd provide a video, they'd, he'd actually be the face of it and try to own the decisions. But the fact that you've got a, a perennial goon running Department of Player Safety, um, okay. I mean, yeah, I guess if you want to put a fox in charge of the hen house, that's the way you can roll. But sooner or later, you guys, are some someone's going to get killed. Honestly, someone's going to take the wrong shot because someone took a liberty because they felt they wouldn't have to pay for it. And it, at least come out, George. And explain why one headshot is not worth discipline while another one is worth discipline. Just explain that to me. Why is a goon in charge? Why is someone like uh, Daniel Carcillo not in charge? Someone, let's put you know, Ryan Klo. And I'm not saying that because he's a former shark. I'm saying that because these are people that have, I mean, firsthand experiences with the effects of CTE. Like, why, why would you put a goon? you know, uh, basically a punching bag at the, at the top of this, <laughs> at the top of the food chain for department of player safety. Someone, I would love for somebody to explain that to me because I don't understand it, but we move on to, uh, the three stars of the series or what we call. Oh, good for you. And, uh, I gotta be honest. I'm having a real hard time coming up with three stars for this, for this round. Obviously, Couture is number one and would have been Jerk's pick. Uh, I'm sure Rocket would have chosen Dylan. Why wouldn't you? <laughs> but uh, for me, I guess, I guess I'm going to go the opposite route and say, how about the not three stars of the round? Um, Hurdle. I love you, man. You, I mean, Hurdle's quite possibly my favorite shark, but only able to net one goal and played well at home but was not good on the road. Uh, Evander Kane, one assist. Uh, again, I think he had one goal throughout the entire playoffs. Not good. Uh, you know, uh, EK65, yeah, two goals, both in the same game, two assists. But, I mean, how many turnovers did he have? The guy was a turnover machine. You know, the, it, Eric Carlson is very much Eric giveth and Eric taketh away. You know, screened Jones on a very key goal in game, game six. So, or I'm sorry, game five. So it's, you know, that, that's kind of where I'm rolling is the not three stars. Because it just didn't, again, like Peter DeBoer said, like Couture said, you know, need more people and weren't getting enough. Not enough. Uh, even Joe Thornton, who, you know, ha had a monster game in one of these, uh, in this round, had a monster game for one game, but largely, you know, LeBanc, Thornton, whether it was Milkman up there, whether it was Sorensen, as great as they were in the first two rounds, they that third, the, all the depth scoring was coming from St. Louis. They St. Louis just had their bottom six guys produce far better. So there you go for that. Uh, Jones's 902 save percentage in these playoffs was the lowest mark of his career and a minus 8.51 goals saved above average. So hopefully we see uh, Jones have a huge bounce back year next year. Couple of, I mean, you can't expect Pavelski to bounce back. He, uh, he had a career year. Can't expect that from Timo. Can't expect that from Hurdle. Those are guys that all had fantastic years. You know, the guys that you're looking at, if they're still here next season, um, is a guy like Donskoy. Um, you could even say that LeBanc had, uh, produced well this year, maybe not as much as expected, or maybe he produced at about what they thought. But my key is I want to see what LeBanc can do when he's not playing with the best center that the Sharks have ever had in their franchise history. That's, that's what I want to see. And, uh, Doug Wilson's going to have some key decisions to make this off season. A lot of free agents and, 
let's be honest, it all kind of starts with EK65. And there's a lot of talk about where he's going to end up. So let's get into Shark Bites. Uh, Chad Johnston from Fan960 says he would be surprised to see Eric Carlson back in San Jose. Uh, he said it's been hard on his family with his wife being from Ottawa. Uh, okay. I mean, anytime, you know, was it not hard on Dan Boyle's family when he moved from Tampa to San Jose? Was it, you know, I don't know. I just thought that was an odd thing to say. Uh, but Chad said, and he's not the only one to say this, that the New York Rangers are the most likely destination for him. Uh, you know, it's a place that Carlson evidently, uh, likes his best, you know, Henrik Lundqvist, super tight with that dude. So, uh, we all know that Rangers, uh, they're going to have some money so you can see him there or the lightning. Uh, now the lightning would have to move heaven and earth with, with regards to the cap hell that they're in, but maybe EK 65 would take a discount to play with Hedman. Who knows? He's tight with Vic, so maybe you see something there. But I'm also, despite the other things that I've heard when it comes to Eric Carlson re-signing uh, with the Sharks, I think Brody Brazil said he put it at 50-50. Heard a couple other people say, oh, you know, oh, no, we've heard a lot of good things. From, uh, okay. Everybody has their outlook. Here's mine. I don't think there is any way in hell Eric Carlson returns to San Jose. And I put this out on social media. If you want to bet me on this, I will take your bet. First one who wants to bet. If Eric Carlson is wearing a teal jersey playing for the Sharks come opening day 2019, uh, I will buy you whether you want a teal one or a stealth one. I'm not buying a white one because it's team teal, damn it. But if you need a stealth one, I understand. Uh, but I will buy you an authentic Adidas Eric Carlson jersey. If he is a, but if Eric, if you take this bet, if Eric Carlson is not a member of the Sharks, come opening day 2019, uh, you have to buy me an authentic Adidas jersey of my choosing. So there you go, putting it out there. Hit me at AJ underscore Strong on Twitter if you're interested. But let's uh, get a little bit further into down to uh, again the narrative and just. Some of the, uh, all the comments about the officiating bar down, put out a comic that showed officials show, basically showed a representative of the four remaining teams, just as the hurricanes had lost their unfortunate, uh, you know, the storm surge just did not have enough boss against Boston. They got swept. And as soon as that series was over, there was a graphic that came out or a comic panel that showed the four, you know, a, a, a player from the four remaining teams. Yeah, St. Louis, Boston, San Jose, and then the Carolina player kind of tripping and falling. All three of them, the, the remaining three, reaching for a cup. You had St. Louis, you had Boston, and then the representative from the Sharks who was being carried on official shoulders. Okay, I think we get what you're trying to get at. I also mentioned the comments from Wojcinski. There's even some comments from some of the guys on NHL Network on Sirius. Even <laughs> Evgeny Malkin from the Penguins decided to weigh in this and say, saying he doesn't understand why the refs are helping the Sharks. Again, I don't remember the officials helping the Sharks score four goals in four minutes. I don't. Yeah, let me see. No, I no, I, I did they give the Sharks the opportunity with the call because the captain was bleeding from his head and they made a judgment call, which based on the rule, that's the way they do it? Sure. But to say helping the Sharks? Uh, hey, Malkin, you might want to watch games four, five, and six between the Sharks and the Blues and then get back to me on that. Okie dokie. Okay, cupcake. So that kind of wraps this up. Speaking of wrapping it up, you know what time it is. We all know what time it is. I have the goddamn common courtesy to give him a reach around. And we, of course, have to reach around to the other 
side of the U.S., the Eastern Conference. As you know, the Boston Bruins swept the Carolina Hurricanes. And how bizarre is this? I mean, each round having a sweep, and then each time a team swept someone, they get swept? Like, what? Who created? What? You know, the Isles sweep the Penguins. Then the Isles get swept by the Hurricanes. Then the Hurricanes get swept by the Bruins. I mean, are the Blues going to get swept? I don't think so. Or I should say, are the Blues going to sweep the Bruins? I don't think so. But who do you root for in this? Honestly, like if you're a Sharks fan or just a sports fan in general, who do you root for this? Do you root for the Blues who just knocked out your favorite team? It's got to be a little hard to uh, root for root for the Blues. Although it's definitely not hard for Vegas fans to do that. If you f- see us on social media, on our Instagram, and on Twitter, there's a couple Vegas fans that were so salty and pissed off, despite it being two rounds ago, showing up to Game 6 in Vegas gear, but with blue paint on their faces saying, you know, Vegas for St. Louis, that we're there to root for St. Louis because we're Vegas fans. Man, that is a staggering amount of salt. I mean, if you got the money to burn, good on you to do that. But wow, wow. I don't, that's, you know, stick tabs to you guys because I've never seen fans do that before. That's that's an amazing amount of vitriol you're, you're holding there. I hope your life gets better, guys, because wow. But who, who do you root for this? Do you root for the team that, what, hasn't been in the final for damn 50 years? Even though they just knocked your team out of the playoffs? Or do you root for the Boston Bruins, who won eight years ago versus Vancouver? That went seven games, and there was a lot of stuff going on then, if you remember. Uh, Alexander Burroughs is biting guys. Uh, I mean, you got all sorts of shenanigans going on in that series. Mm, I, t- or are you kind of like me where you're like, you know what, Boston, you guys, the whole New England area, you've won enough, okay? You've got the current NFL and MLB champs, or <laughs> what did I say? <laughs> the current NFL and MLB champs, uh, you know, look, the Patriots are 3-2, and two in the Super Bowl since 2011. Since the last time the Bruins won, the Patriots have been to five Super Bowls, okay? Including going to the last three. The Red Sox have won the World Series twice, okay? I feel like the Boston area... Oh, no, wait, no. Oh, I'm getting this wrong. You know what? Boston, man, they're lucky. Did Did I do that right? Did I get that right? Man, Boston's really lucky. It's not like those teams went out and earned those victories or took advantage of opportunities they were given. They were lucky. So perhaps Boston will be lucky yet again, and we will see the Stanley Cup held up yet again by Zdeno Chara and company one more time. Or do you root for the Blues? It's a, it's a tough call. Hit me up on Twitter. Tell me who, what you're thinking. It's gonna be uh, it's gonna be a harsh one, but it does start in Boston Monday, the twenty seventh of May. So are you uh, breaking out your black and gold? Are you breaking out your blue and gold? What you gonna do? Uh, I honestly, <laughs> my favorite catchphrase or one of many, I am unsure. I'm unsure. It's hard to root for a team that has Marchand on it, uh, the guy who sucker punches people, guy who licks people. It's hard to root for a player like that. Conversely, Tarasenko took a little bit of a sucker punch at Timo Meyer. Hard to root for a guy like that. So, I I don't know. I will figure it out. It, you know what? It'll you'll probably be like me. You'll watch a game or two, and somebody will do something stupid, and you'll immediately root for the opposing team after that. So, I guess we'll just wait until then. With that, uh, I think. That's going to be it, guys. Enjoy the Stanley Cup final. Enjoy your summers. We'll see you all in October. But there won't be a lack of Sharks news to discuss. You've got the draft, got free agent frenzy, and Doug Wilson has a lot of decisions to make in this offseason. 
So for Rocket and Hockey Jerk, you know where to find them at our backhander76 at hockey underscore jerk. Both of those on the Twitter machine. And as always, you can find me on Instagram, on Twitter at AJ underscore strong and find everything at Teal Town USA. Once again, subscribe to us, whatever podcast platform you listen to us on. We would certainly appreciate that if you listen to a different podcast platform that we're not on, by all means, hit us up, let us know so we can make sure that we get there. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram, both of those at Teal Town USA. And as always, thank you for listening. We will see you next year, and it can't come soon enough.